for doing this. We're really happy to have you. Um, and I, I want to, is this, is the audio okay? I'm hearing a little bit of better. echo. Okay, that's, that's better. better. Um, so uh, I want to, there's so much to cover. Uh, I want to focus mostly on the pre-presidency because that's less well understood. And your book covers it all, but you are the, um, you know, the, the greatest authority on his pre-presidential life, I think by far. Um, but before I jump into, you know, New York politics um, and business, uh, just in terms of today's news. So the January 6th committee issued a subpoena. Is there any chance that he will appear? There's a chance, uh, and thank you all very much for being here. Um, there is, uh, and Dave for hosting. Uh, there is a chance that he will say, yes, I will appear if you let me testify live and no constraints, no conditions. And I think that the chances that the committee uh, would agree to that are, are fairly slim uh, because I think they would fear it would turn into a circus. Um, it, in reality, it would, it would probably be one of the smarter things they could do would be to just let him appear under, under penalty of perjury in mm -hmm. public. Um, so I wouldn't say it's completely out of the question, but it's uh, at the moment, it seems a, a ways away. Won't they look bad if they say, you know, we issued the subpoena, you answer the subpoena, and now we don't want to do it because it's not going to be live? It wouldn't be the first time they've done that. So I, I don't think that would be a huge concern of theirs. Yeah. Um, and I think that they would point to the fact that he has a rather uh, well-worn history of turning big events like this into a, something of a spectacle. Remember that debate with Biden where Biden finally said, won't you just shut up? And he, <laughs> yes, I do. And he, he interrupted Chris Wallace, I think uh, literally a hundred times. It was a lot. The debate. Yeah, it was a lot. <clears throat> um, all right, there was something else that happened recently that really intrigued me. And I, I'm just interested whether, um, you shared this. So you, you write in the book about how uh, he um, often says things in public, and that's a form of protection for him. Like if he had privately sought the help of Russia on Hillary's emails, it would have been a huge scandal. Mm -hmm. But by saying in public, Russia, are you listening? And he also projects onto other people yes. things that he has done himself. So I believe it was last week in a speech, he went back to his kind of uh, O.J. Simpson defense. They planted the evidence in Mar-a-Lago and he's never argued this in court, which tells you, you know, why it's not true. But he, he publicly was saying that the FBI had planted evidence on him. But what interested me was the evidence that he used yes, as his yes, example. Yes which was, he said, like, they could plant a book on how do you make a nuclear bomb? It was very specific, wasn't it? It was very specific. And what did you take from that? Exactly what you did. I mean, you know, there was, um, when you talk to people in, in, in Trump's orbit, when they deny things, because it, they tend to mirror, not, not all of them, but, but a bunch of people in his world start to mirror his behaviors. Um, and, I, and I write about this in the book, but, um, you know, when you ask a question about what what's what what happened, you'll often get that or a piece of information. You'll get back. That's not true. Who told you that? Well, if it's not true, why does it matter who told me? And so there's a there's a degree of, uh, you know, it's it's not true that they found anything like this. For instance, um, it's already been reported by the Washington Post that um, there were there was material related to another country's nuclear capabilities. Uh, that was found uh, at Mar-a-Lago. I don't, I don't know if there was only one such document, right? We're talking about 300 individual classified documents. Um, so it was doing the thing that he often does, which is say something in public that uh, at least on the surface appears like it could be some kind of omission. I didn't think that that was uh, necessarily a calculated way of you know, ripping off the Band-Aid and doing it publicly. Um, but it, it may very well have been. 
And it may be that it's uh, about something more than just another country's nuclear Correct. Uh, capability. And you know these, these nuclear secrets are worth a lot on the market if you were to use an intermediary to try to sell them. They are. I, I, I think that, um, you know, th there, there are a couple of buckets in which you could put the big, the big thing we don't know about the, why he had these documents is the why. Um, and there have been a lot of uh, theories that have been tested, you know, knowing him, there are a couple of possibilities. One is what you just described, which is monetizing. Um, that requires a level of um, uh, competence. Uh, and, and people around him who could execute that, that is a little harder to see at the moment. Um, it's not impossible. Uh, and, and, you know, there are all kinds of people coming in and out of Mar-a-Lago, so who knows. Uh, one is that he loves trophies. And, you know, if, if anyone who has ever been to Trump Tower and goes to his office gets the tour of his stuff, which includes a, a giant sneaker that was Shaquille O'Neal's and, you know, and here's some framed picture of Scott Walker and me that Scott Walker sent me and, and on and on and on. Um, you know, and in the, in the White House, he loved having trophies. The, the Kim Jong-un letters were trophies. Um, but ultimately with him, so much of what he does and seeks is about leverage and having leverage over someone else or something else, or other people, other, other, other entities. Uh, and I can't discount that either. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't know what that leverage necessarily is, but everything is about what have I got that you want and what can I use in some way? Um, so he described you as his psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> what do you think he meant by that? And, and how would you characterize you know, your relationship? I don't think he meant much. Um, I, what he, uh, he had this line uh, at the, toward the end of one of our interviews uh, the, the last interview in September, 2021. And, um, and he said, I love being with her. She's like my psychiatrist when he was sort of, you know, ventilating about something. And what I write is that it was a meaningless line, you know, certainly intended to flatter the kind of thing he has said about, he has said that about other interviews. He has said it about his Twitter feed. Um, the reality is he treats everyone like they are his psychiatrists because he is, working everything out in real time, all the time. Um, and in terms of relationship, I think that's the wrong word. He's a subject who I cover. And I covered Hillary Clinton and I covered Mike Bloomberg and I covered Rudy Giuliani. And at more of a remove, I covered three presidents. Um, you know, it's just different with him because he interacts with news coverage so differently. And he has such a specific fixation on the New York Times. And I'm just the person who covers him most often for the Times. Ben Smith made an interesting point that um, he, he argued that he needs you more than you need him. And I think one thing, we're talking about this in the green room, that I think people who are not journalists don't understand is that getting the access to the principal, you know, whether it's uh, the president or someone, is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> you, don't, right. you don't really need their quotes Right. When you do find something newsworthy, contrary to some bullshit on, on uh, the internet, you put it in the New York Times in real time when he breaks news, which isn't that often. No. And the, the um, you know, the, I think the misunderstanding of the uh, reporter subject relationship is something that I'd like you to straighten out a little bit for people. Sure, and I, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I do understand that, that people don't understand it or, or have misconceptions of it. it what, you, what you said about Twitter, uh, you know, I think one of the, the worst parts about Twitter is that a lot of people get not only their news from Twitter these days, but they get their understanding of journalism from right. Twitter. And um, there are a lot of misconceptions about, uh, about the profession and about the way journalism works. Um, particularly with Donald Trump, it's true with any, and you know this, you have interviewed more people than I ever will, but there are, you know, there's always, depending on who you're interviewing, there's always going to be a spectrum of what you're likely to get out of it. With Donald Trump, um, you, you, you're guaranteed that it's, um, 
it's not going to be uh, truthful throughout much of it. Um, it is not necessarily going to be um, coherent throughout much of it because he talks like this. Um, and so they, you know, going in and, and interviewing someone is not, and making sure that they're, you know, talking to you, I will cover him whether he's talking to me or not. I don't need his permission to cover him. And he's never actually understood that. Um, he, he just fundamentally doesn't understand what journalists do, which is puts him in, a, in, in that same category. Um, the way that I approached these interviews was they offered me the first one. And I, I literally thought, and they offered everybody basically who was doing a book a first, uh, an interview, almost everybody, um, because that's just how he is. And he kind of can't help himself, including Michael Wolf, who wrote the, you know, the, the, the sort of most damning initial book portrait of the Trump White House. Um, and when they, when they offered it to me at first, I thought, I'm really not gonna get, this is, I'm not gonna get anything out of this. And then when I went down there, he was actually, um, he said much more because I was talking to him about New York and the past than I had expected him to. So then I sought two subsequent interviews, um, one of which yielded, you know, not a ton. And then the second, the third one yielded a little more. Um, but it is, as you say, you know, you're talking to somebody who often, um, who often doesn't tell the truth. And then, you know, a print interview is different than a television interview. You know, you're trying to ask questions and get information. It's not a moment for television. So. Um, I, I thought it was great that in the middle of the book, you have, uh, you know, his responses to some of your fact-checking questions and some of the, you know, the, the questions that you raise about parts of his past. But my problem with it is that he he lies every yes. time he opens his mouth. You know, he lies as easily as he breathes. So what is any of that actually worth journalistic? What's the value? I mean, I think this yeah. is the question that we we struggle with daily, right? I mean, he's a he's now a former president. He's not Donald Trump, the developer. I think the time for people, and and I, I've thought about this a lot in the process of writing this book. There's been a lot of criticism of 2016 campaign coverage. Um, and I think some of it is valid. I think some of it is less so. Uh, I don't think that the overall portrait of Donald Trump in 2016 was flattering uh, from the coverage. I think in the aggregate, it was, I think voters had a pretty clear sense of who this guy was. I think there could have been more on his business ties. I personally think that was a big underexplored area, given that we just never had a president with these kinds of entanglements, particularly foreign entanglements. Um, where I think there is a significant criticism of the media uh, in terms of giving weight to his words is the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, when he is doing all of this myth-making about himself mm -hmm. and building this artifice brick by brick of himself as this massively successful tycoon, you know, commensurate with, with you know, Jack Welch and all of these other people who Trump tried to, you know, pretend he was at the same level as. Um, and often, you know, despite the fact that people knew that he didn't tell the truth a lot of the time, his statements just went unchecked in some cases for years. And that I think is a problem. Now he's a former president and he's got enormous sway in the Republican party still. And at least when it comes to a book about his life, he's still the only person who can answer some of these questions. So I felt yeah. the need to go to him. Um, the, uh, I, you know, my, overall take on him, and I'm wondering whether this is yours as well, is that just when you think he's touched bottom, he crashes through the floor. Right? So, so do you see, because you have this, you've been covering him for more than 20 years. Do you, do you see the same progression that, you know, you, you think that things have gotten as bad as they are, and then you find out something else that's even worse. I've never discussed, I've never seen somebody whose desire to test the limits of transgressive behavior um, uh, is so intense as with him. And so every time you, I think, think you put it very well, every time you think that there is, um, he's hit a limit, um, you know, there, there, is, there is no limit. Um, and, and I think that January 6th, 2021 really showed that uh, coupled with, you know, a few months later, he starts fomenting this idea that 
his supporter, Mike Lindell, was spreading that he was going to get reinstated <laughs> to the White House. So, I mean, but that's as you know, it's it's silly um, because there's no such mechanism. But there are supporters of his out there who don't realize that. And so it is something that is very dangerous to be engaging in and encouraging conservative writers to um, to spread, which is what he was doing in 2021. And when I reported this in real time that he was saying this, I got a lot of blowback um, from people who said we should ignore him. I don't think you can ignore that at this point. I think we've seen the impact of that kind of language from him on his supporters. We, when we should have ignored him, to your point, is, is when he was on the way up, and I'm as guilty of this as any New York journalist, I would go over to Trump Tower and interview him because he was always available. It was, and he knew that we were, yeah. you know, we needed copy. copy and or he, or he quotes also, for TV and, pieces. Yeah, yeah. And he would feed the TV crews. Yep. I remember I went over there with an NBC crew mm. at one point. He had food for them. They loved it, you know. So he understood, <laughs> he might not understand journalism, but he, when he ran for president, he was the most experienced- No question. Uh, uh, candidate in the thing that counts the most, Correct. which is the media and being on television. He, there is uh, absolutely no question that his dexterity with being on TV was a huge value for him. And it gave him an enormous edge over everybody else. Uh, and he, as much as he you know, hates parts of the media, he, he loves it and needs it. And that was just a contrast to every other person with the possible ex exception of Mike Huckabee, who he was running against right. at various points in that cycle. There's just nobody else who enjoyed it the way he did and who doesn't, I would put it slightly differently too, Jonathan, he doesn't experience news coverage the way anyone else I've ever covered does. You know, Stories that would humiliate other people or they'd be embarrassed to have out there. He revels in, you know, that famous New York Post front page that was allegedly said by Marla Maples and wasn't actually with the, the best sex I ever had um, in, in 1990. He loved it. He, you know, he, he, he was delighted by it. Most people would be cringing at that. One of the great things you do is over and over again, you give the backstory of that. So, you know, you, you figure out the, the, the editor at the New York Post who, basically concocted that whole thing out of nothing. Um, but without unpacking all of the, too many of those stories, I, I'm interested in his kind of mentors, the people that he modeled his behavior on. We know uh, his reverence for his father, um, who was arrested at a Ku Klux Klan demonstration in 1925, gives you some idea of what Fred Trump was like. Um, but let's talk about some of the others. Roy Cohn, what did he learn from Roy Cohn? So Roy Cohn becomes Trump's lawyer in 1973 when Trump and his father and their business are being sued by the Justice Department for racially discriminatory housing practices. And Cohn tells Trump, fight like hell. And Trump learns a couple of things. One is that you can use the court system interchangeably with public relations. Um, you can shout as loud as possible and try to keep whoever's challenging you at bay for a while that way. You can threaten and intimidate and menace. Um, even if you settle, you won't say you're settling. And most specifically, what he learned is that the role of a, of a lawyer could be turned into something almost like a mafia don, like just something completely different um, than, than what lawyers are supposed to do. Um, a longtime Trump friend has said to me on several occasions, uh, Trump likes lawyers who are willing to do anything. Well, did he turn himself into a mafia don? I mean, he gave six apartments in Trump Tower to uh, the mistress of uh, um, a, a big mobster mm -hmm. and he flew John Gotti's uh, top lieutenant on his helicopter to Atlantic City. And then later claimed he didn't know the guy. Uh, so, and he never keeps records like a mob no. boss, right? No, there, no there, email. No, 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 record, no notes, no record. I mean, right. there, look, I, I think that it's, there's a, there's a wannabe quality about it with Trump, but there, are, there is certainly, um, and Roy, one of, among Roy's, Roy Cohn's clients were mobsters. Um, and then, you know, the mafia was deep into the concrete industry in New York City, which was the material that Trump chose to build Trump Tower with. Um, and, and then he had interactions with, with uh, mafia-linked folks when he was doing his casino projects. Um, you know, 
at minimum, Trump has no problem with it. At, at, at most, I would say he, he's, he gravitates toward that. Um, and he certainly adopts those kinds of behaviors in um, giving, and Michael Cohen talks about this all the time, you know, that Trump sort of speaks in a code and gives, gives you a sense of what he wants you to do without openly saying it. So um, we know that he adopted um, this character, John Barron, then he named his son Barron, you know, where he'd pretend to be this other guy on the phone. But I learned from your book, I had never heard of Vinny before. Who was Vinny? What was that about? <laughs> so Vinny was um, uh, the name of someone who called, this is a complicated story. Trump was in the middle of trying to get a tax abatement for Trump Tower and the, um, the, the housing commissioner in New York City who worked for Ed Koch and Ed Koch was not a Donald Trump fan. Um, he, he, he encouraged um, Tony Glidman, this commissioner, and this is actually an important story in a couple of ways, encourages Tony Glidman, the commissioner, to reject the tax abatement. Trump ends up going to court. He ultimately wins, it takes years. In the interim, Tony Glidman gets a, a call at his home one morning from someone who identifies himself as Vinny. And Vinny is very upset that Mr. Trump is not getting his tax abatement. And there's a, there's a threat in this. Um, Glidman reports this uh, to officials. Um, he is given a security detail. Um, uh, it was, I think the next day, I don't have the book in front of me, but the next day, Trump himself claims he too got a threatening call, um, <laughs> which was so surprising. Um, and, that and, and that call became known many years later when the FBI files were undone. Now there's no hard proof of who called Trump, but there is widespread skepticism for people around Tony Glidman that, uh, that it was Trump himself. The way this story ends is that Trump gets the tax abatement. Uh, eventually he wins in court and it, it's the details are, are, are a little dense, but ultimately Glidman, who has two children uh, and uh, a bad weight problem, uh, gets a call from Trump inviting him to lunch. And Trump ultimately offers him a job and Glidman takes it. And Ed Koch almost fell over when he found out that Glidman was gonna go work for Trump. And I would argue that that was one of the very earliest examples, at least that I know of, of Trump threatening someone and then them giving in. Right, bending them to his will. Bending them to his will. Um, and he told him he'd only hire him if he lost weight. Said he had to lose weight was one of the conditions. Sort of like saying to Larry King on the air, you've got bad breath. Right, and, and scooting away from him. Um, all right, so other people that he modeled behavior uh, from, George Steinbrenner, what so, did he learn? So Steinbrenner um, was this sort of avatar of hypermasculinity in the 1980s when the AIDS era was beginning. And Trump, um, Trump was terrified of AIDS uh, and, and talked about it all the time. And after shaking hands with men would, you know, call people, call reporters and say, is blah, blah, gay, I just shook hands with them. Um, and from Stein, you know, Steinbrenner was this, you know, big tough guy who, you know, is also a child of privilege like Trump and who uh, had a healthy dose of, of uh, self-regard like Trump. And, Trump hung around him and hung around his crew. You know, he had he had friends uh, like a, like a man named Bill Fugazi, who also was friends with Roy Cohn, uh, Lee Iacocca. There was this crew, and Trump wanted to be like them and found himself emulating this hypermasculinity. Um, Steinbrenner was famous for firing his managers, um, except he wasn't doing it by play acting. When Trump Trump, who really doesn't like firing people directly, when he's doing The Apprentice, starts with you're fired. And it was pretty widely seen as an homage to Steinbrenner. And that, that changed, that show changed everything for him. I, I think most people are pretty familiar with that, but they're not familiar, many people with a man named Mead Esposito. <laughs> Who was he and what did Trump learn from him? Mead Esposito was the Brooklyn Democratic uh, Party boss when machine boss politics ruled everything uh, in New York City. Um, and Trump's father, Fred, was very close to Meade. And, and that helped them hardwire all kinds of projects in Brooklyn. And Meade had enormous clout all over the city. Uh, 
And when Trump first came into office, you know, and Meade was, was, Meade was ruthless. He was a criminal. Um, he did not believe that rules and regulations applied. He, you know, to him, um, uh, he made judges, he made district attorneys. Uh, and when Trump came into office, you know, he would, he would talk about a figure who sounded very much like me. And AIDS had no idea who he was talking about because most of his officials who worked for him in the White House weren't from New York. But he would talk about me swinging, um, I think he described it as, people thought it was a baseball bat, it was a cane. Um, and he told me this story in one of our interviews about Meade Esposito swinging his cane at people. And he said, Meade ruled with an iron fist. And Meade is one of the people who helped inform Trump's idea of two things. One of how a, a, a political operator functions and rules, which is just top down. Uh, and the other is that Meade fit Trump's idea of strength. And a lot of Trump's idea of strength is informed by violence. Violence informs what makes you strong. That in turn informs what makes a good boss. And Meade very much falls into that category. Um, he, he, it's almost like he, uh, he's almost like a Tammany Hall. Correct. Kind of idea. Of, of 100, 100 he, he, there is a to Washington. direct line. Yeah. Um, so there's also, you know, his um, despicable, most despicable qualities, the cruelty was also in evidence earlier. Um, tell us what happened after the helicopter crash and what mm -hmm. he said about the deceased uh, executives. So a bunch of Trump executives uh, died in a helicopter crash in New Jersey. Uh, I think it was on their way back from a meeting at Trump Tower. Two things happened afterwards. One was that um, somehow an item got placed, I believe it was in page six, suggesting that Trump himself was supposed to be on this helicopter, um, which nobody believed because it was at least a least helicopter and he didn't like to fly those himself. Um, Roger Stone has insisted that it really was true. So do it that way you will. Um, and the, the, the widows and, and one either girlfriend or fiance, there were three people involved uh, of the, the dead men were, were really aghast at this suggestion that Trump himself was somehow in danger. Um, and he later on started to blame his, his financial woes at the casinos on one of those dead executives. And he says to one of his officials, whose name was Jack O'Donnell, you know, he's dead, what does it matter what I say about him now? And that really stayed with Jack O'Donnell, who actually wrote his own book. Um, but there is a, you know, a chronic, in all of these descriptions from people who have been around him for a very long time, just a chronic disregard for other people's feelings, emotions, um, you know, decency in, in times of stress. So you say that he actually doesn't have that many moves, and he uses them over and over again. Uh, in part because he understands the value of repetition, mm -hmm. you know, which is very important in politics yep. and especially democratic politicians are terrible at repeating things. In, in the case of both Obama and Clinton, it was because it bored them to say the same thing over and over again, but that made them less effective. So that is kind of an overall move that he has repetition, but then there are some specific moves. And I wanted to go over them and see if you could give us an example sure. of each. So the first one you mentioned is the counterattack. So that is, um, you know, Hillary Clinton calls him a puppet of Putin. No puppet, you're the puppet. It's all just going right back at you with some uh -huh. form of projection. Uh -huh. um, so strongest defense is an offense. Right? Yes, or, or you write a story and he starts hate tweeting you. That's another right. good example. Right. Uh, the quick lie. <laughs> uh, in, in one of our interviews, I asked him what he was doing during the January 6th attack, which at that point was not um, part of the, the actual, you know, under oath public record because the House Select Committee hearings hadn't started. And he immediately said uh, that he wasn't watching television, um, that, you know, he, and that he rarely had the TV on. Um, so that would be a good example. The shift of blame. <laughs> I mean, there, there are so many on those. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's my campaign manager's fault that I'm losing. Um, 
uh, threatening to sue his campaign manager because the poll numbers are bad. Um, uh, you know, finding finding some aid to to shoulder whatever crisis is going on. Nothing is ever his fault. Ever. The distraction. Well, that one is you know. There's a there's a there's a bunch in that in that category, but uh, for instance, um, and this one, you know, people insist that these photos showed up organically, but uh, when he was in the middle of a lot of questions right after the Republican National Convention in 2017, uh, 2016, sorry, about uh, about Russia and about his comments about Russia, um, and this was after the email hacks of the DNC. And suddenly these nude pictures of Melania Trump show up on the front page of the New York Post from a decade earlier. And Donald Trump, who um, uh, does not like uh, when people write about his life unless he wants to control it, appeared to have no problem with this. So um, that was a distraction. The outburst of rage. Well, that's, I mean, I, I, I can lose count on that one. Right. I mean, you can see that you can see that one all the time, but it is, there is, uh, the screaming at people to get them in line is something that he has done throughout his life. Uh, and people in the White House, when he was, when he had just won, uh, somebody who had worked for him years ago said to me, he is a screamer and people in the White House are gonna have a really hard time with this. And indeed they did, so. Um, the performative anger, sometimes it's not genuine Those, rage. I, so I will give you a, for instance, um, some of the tweets, and I, I, you'll ask me for a specific one and I can't right now, but some of the tweets that are all caps mm -hmm. that we would all describe as him fuming, he would be laughing as he was sending them. That's a good example. Uh, just for the headlines claim. <laughs> uh, well, let's see, um, Obama tapped my phone would be a right. good example of that one in 2017 with no evidence um, other than some Breitbart story that he was reading. Uh, but knew he would get a headline out of it. Right, or, or one that just got blown apart today. He said um, that Pelosi didn't do anything yes. to protect the Capitol. Yes. And video came out today of her trying to, you know, get the National, National Guard, Guard there. there and, you know, in the middle, in the middle of the day on January 6th. And Trump, of course, is doing nothing. Um, uh, so I think you call it indecisiveness masked by compensatory lunge. <laughs> um, so when he couldn't, I mean, this is going to sound hard to believe, but he really couldn't after November 3rd in 2020 when he lost, he could not decide what course of action to follow when it became clear that he was not going to be able to stay in office anymore. And he was quizzing everybody, including the valet who brought him his Diet Cokes. You know, what do you think I should do? Um, and then after he doesn't get what he wants uh, from anybody and, and it becomes clear that he's not quite ready to pull the trigger on this proposed government intervention that Mike Flynn, the former national security advisor is telling him he should do. Um, he's seizing, seizing, seizing the voting machines correct. like in a fascist yes. regime. In yeah. it, like, yes, using executive yeah. orders to do so. Yeah. Um, he suddenly seizes on January 6th and throws all of his energy into it. And I would put that as a, an example. Why do you think uh, so little sticks to him? Why is he the ultimate Teflon president? I think a couple of things. Um, I think the fact that he was part of the pop culture fabric for so long, and part of this does relate to The Apprentice, which you mentioned, uh, not entirely, but what became clear in 2016 was that voters felt very, his voters felt very bonded to him in ways that they really didn't with previous candidates. There was this huge desire to win um, and voters were willing to overlook a lot. And then they got in the habit of overlooking all kinds of things. Um, and I just think that the partisan divide is so hardened that there is half the country is now not interested in forgiving him much if, if he's the nominee again. I do think there are aspects of the Republican Party that have grown sick of him. I do. And I, I think we will start to see more of that in the coming months uh, because I think there are a lot of candidates who are going to run. I don't think it's that nothing sticks to him. I think that especially at the beginning of 2022, 
this issue with the documents. And I, I do think that he was taking on some water in relation to that. Now I think it's baked in. Um, but I think with him, there is so much. And I do think during the presidency, everything was sort of treated as if it was a four alarm fire. And, and not everything was a four alarm fire. There were a number of them. Um, but when everything is, a, is an emergency, then, then voters start to feel like nothing is. So what do you think was the most blown out of proportion and harmful to the Democrats by making too much of it? I think that, um, I think that the, I'm trying to think how to say this carefully. The, I mean, A, I think a couple of things. I th kids in cages, huge deal. Um, and really, you know, and, and a humanitarian crisis. Um, uh, every single tweet that he did, not a huge deal. Uh, did not all need to be treated as if they were, uh, they were all the same. Um, you know, every, every, every gaffe he made, every nonsensical answer he gave, not all the same. Um, you know, congratulating Putin on winning his election when he'd been told not to, that's, a, that's important. Um, uh, his praise of Xi Jinping, that's important, but everything just became, you know, one big thing. And I think it became harder for people to see what was So going. there was a crying wolf problem? Maybe? I don't know if it's crying wolf, but it's just crying outrage when at, at the same volume every time. It's not wolf because there's always something there. It's so just, it's just the volume. The uh, anti-Trump conservative writer, David French, wrote re recently about what he calls the exhausted majority. I saw that. And which I thought was an interesting yep. line. So it was part of it that he just wears, wears everybody out. out. Yes, and, and absorbed Roy Cohn's lesson that he articulated to William Sapphire, which is that he brings out the worst in his enemies and gets them to defeat themselves. And I think there is something to that. So his, if you were breaking down his manipulative powers um, of sensing people's weaknesses and then exploiting yep. them, is that is that his superpower that he has? He has this ability to have sort of an X-ray vision of what somebody's weaknesses. I think it's one of them. Um, I think the fact that he has an ability to to pick up on other people's. Uh, insecurities is one of them. Uh, and I think his shamelessness is another. I think his shamelessness right. has been a huge edge in politics. Uh, and I think that for him, and I think the fact, and certainly in, in, his, in his business life, um, and I think the fact that he is really um, hyper-focused on sort of the darkness of human emotions. Um, you know, he is, he is really, really attuned to bad things people will do and tries to sort of play off of that. Um, and he is aware that other people experience shame and he tries to press that too. There's a power in shamelessness. Correct, a big one. I mean, he has really used it to great effect for himself. And how transferable is it? I mean, we see DeSantis is trying to go to his playbook, they're probably gonna have a pretty bloody primary. How do you think his imitators will do? I think not that well. I think that, you know, including that I'm not convinced that there's gonna be a DeSantis Trump primary. You're not. I'm not. I mean, Why? I think, I, because I think that everybody talks about wanting to, you know, they'll be the ones to take him on and it's actually pretty unpleasant for everybody who does. And so stepping into that meat grinder is um, is more challenging than it looks. Well, in private, he says of DeSantis that he's whiny, fat, and a phony. Uh, True. So that gives us some. I think you, the warm up material is definitely <laughs> visible. Yes. Right. Well, and I don't, and I don't think that um, you know DeSantis is in the middle of dealing with a hurricane and dealing with a natural disaster is obviously very different right. from any governor, um, and we have seen a a tempering by DeSantis of some of the things that, you know, he, he appeared with Biden. Um, he has, he has been less combative, um, but he has had, mo he has had moments prior to Hurricane Ian where uh, he has seemed less than ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that there's a very long history of Republican donors and members of the media anointing someone as the next whatever 
And it doesn't always come out that way. Scott Walker, Tim Pawlenty. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can go down the list. And so uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time covering those people. And so, so did I. I mean, to be clear, <laughs> I, I count myself among those reporters who, who, who have done that. Do um, you think so, yeah. that Trump's heart really isn't in 2024? Why? Because I think that a couple of things. I think that um, I think he's really consumed by these investigations. Um, I think that the the documents investigation in particular is really scaring him. Uh, I think that the press accounts by CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post are showing uh, patterns of behavior that I think are alarming some of his own advisors and that he's aware DOJ is paying attention to. I mean, the, the, the main proof that he is worried is that he spent a $3 million upfront retainer on a lawyer whose advice he has completely ceased to listen to, P.S., but he was worried enough that he hired the guy. And I got calls from people who worked for Trump in the 1990s who said Donald has never paid all right. that big a retainer. That tells you all you need to know. Well, a lot of times he doesn't pay at all. Well, that's that's why this was so surprising. Um, so, and he just doesn't seem animated by the rallies the way he once did. Mm -hmm. um, they're really long with not a lot of new material. And so we'll see. I mean, maybe he'll get into it if he does become a candidate. I do think he has backed himself into a corner where he has to run because I think the investigations, um, you know, oddly compel him forward. But we'll see. Hmm. Um, so if you had to bet, would you say that he will be the nominee? <laughs> I, I'm not falling for that one again. No, um, I um, I think that if he runs, he remains the overwhelming favorite to be the nominee, but that is obviously absent um, outcomes in these investigations. And I just don't know what that looks like. Um, does he um, actually believe in anything beyond his himself? Um, he has a couple of core id-like impulses on issues like trade or you know, other countries ripping us off you know, more broadly um, on alliances. Um, but he's willing to sublimate those if there's some other reason to. Um, I, I, you know, McConnell, I remember, was telling people during the transition in 2016, I mean, he was clearly just kind of stunned by this, just that he, this guy has no idea. He would, he would say this guy has no idea what he believes in. And, um, uh, and I think, to your point, he, he does know what he believes in. He believes in himself and what's good for him. And so uh, that can look like different things in different moments. Um, and do you do you ever get the sense that he is untethered from reality, or do you think it's all, you know, connected to his alternative universe in some way that you can kind of track how it makes a certain amount of sense in his own? Aren't those the same terms? thing? I mean, if if he's if he's untethered to reality right. and he's also it's sort of like the same thing to me. Well, he's creating his own reality, I guess. Um, but you're saying, is he doing it knowingly and he's just yeah. trying to bring you along? Or is it uh, all uh, instinctive? Um, sometimes it's instinctive. Sometimes he knows. I mean, one of the things about him that um, people came to realize over time working in the White House was, you know, he's not strategic at all. He can't right. do long-term planning, but he is very calculating in a given moment. Um, and so, you know, it's more of what your second option is, which is that he's, he is trying to create this reality and get you to buy into it more often than not. Now, I think then sometimes he ends up really believing what he's saying. So I, I couldn't tell you if he actually believes what he's saying about the election or not. I have no idea. I don't know that it matters. But So since he's not strategic, what is his timeline? Is it just the next news cycle? It's, is it a week? Is it, it a month? It's, six it's, months? It, it is literally, uh -huh. you know, an hour, hour by hour, basically. I mean, it is, it is, he, is he is existing in the now always. Um, I'm almost ready to get your questions if somebody's <laughs> got them or you've got them over there. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's get your questions. I mean, I, I um, That's so good. I couldn't... Oh, actually, before we go to these, I want to go to race, uh, the question of race. Um, so um, you, um, you know, one of your big scoops that came out a few months ago is in the book is that he was flushing documents down the toilet. Um, but there's another toilet story in your book. There's a lot of Donald we, Trump toilet stories. But so just tell the one that really goes to his racial animus. 
So when he um, when he was first in the Oval Office, um, he would he would show people what he would call his secret bathroom off the Oval Office, um, and he would claim that he had um, renovated the entire space down to the toilet, uh, which was not true, according to officials. I think they they just customarily replace the toilet seat anytime there's a new president. Um, but he would he would show he would show this space and. And he would say, you understand what I'm talking about. And it was a very strange remark and, you know, open to interpretation, but, you know, one, one guest who heard it interpreted it as him not wanting to use his black predecessor's bathroom. And, um, you know, there's, there is just, um, there is a lot of that with him over a very long period of time. There was a, I have reporting in the book about how the first time the first uh, executive, the first person to work on the executive floor at Trump Tower who was black was in 1986, as if this was innovative. And it was the, actually it was the, the woman who was, had been working as an assistant to the person we talked about before, Tony Glidman. And Trump's assistant, a woman named Norma Federer, was all oh, a flutter that, you know, we've never had a, a black person on the executive floor. Um, and then it was deemed that she was, she was so pretty, she would fit right in, um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's just, it just, ex, it, it is, it is a reminder of a couple of things, but one of which is actually that as much as New York City is seen as a progressive um, beacon, there are aspects of it that really are not. I mean, some of the big public things like birtherism was, was, pretty clear. was thoroughly yeah. racist, but there are detail, other details you have, like, I didn't know that he had a girlfriend before, just before Melania. At the over, at, overlapping with her. Yeah, yeah. Overlapping with Melania. Yeah. Um, half black, father was white. white, mother was black. And he, what, he told, what did he say about her? He met her parents and he told her that uh, she got her beauty from her mom and her brains from her dad at the white side. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's uh, uh, look at some of these questions from all of you. Um, what um, do you think motivates the children? Do you think that they uh, are politically ambitious? Uh, he, I think, I think Don Jr. certainly is, um, Ivanka, yes, but I would quite frankly be very surprised if she actually ever ran for office, given what it entails. Uh, I don't think Eric Trump is at all politically ambitious. Um, so this question, um, is, uh, uh, sort of about his style in an interview, um, um, you know, so what's the feel you get from him when you're sitting right across from him? Is he, is he charismatic in, in person? Is he, does he try to bully you? Is he, he charming you? Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he, all of he can be all of those things. I have interviewed him when he has been charming, which he was in the first interview I did for this book. Um, and he was in salesman mode. And then I've interviewed him, you know, at other times, particularly one very memorable one in the white house in 2017, where, you know, we walked in and he had his, hands jammed in his armpits and he's sitting behind the Resolute desk and he's rolling very heavy with like eight to 10 aides sitting around the, this is not normal to do in, a, in an Oval Office uh, meeting with reporters. Um, and so there are, there are times when he tries to menace and intimidate and times when he doesn't, it just depends. And do you think it depends on his mood or is there calculation? Both. Is he, is he thinking it through a little bit? Like, what do I want to try to do today in this interview? So that one was, was that. That one was definitely calculating. The second interview that I went to for the book, he was in a terrible mood. And I found out later that he had been wandering around his property at Mar-a-Lago, like pointing out messed up plaster in various spots. And um, he was angry at how the club looked. And so that one was pretty organic. Mm. Um, so, um, um, this, this kind of goes to the reality question, but, uh, and it's, you know, it was the subject of today's hearing. Um, how much do you think he accepts that he lost the election? Oh, I don't think he accepts it at all. Whether, whether, he, whether he knows on some level that he did, I think he, he did at one point, I don't know if he does now, but he certainly doesn't accept it. Right. But do you, I mean, there, there's a lot of testimony that he would say to people, how did I lose to this? Guy? Oh, no. And I have reporting on that in the book. I mean, he was, it seemed pretty clear to people right after, immediately after the election, that he knew that he had lost. He would say to one eight, I thought we had it. 
you know, he, he seemed almost apologetic to some of them. Um, I think he was clear that that it was over and then he decided it wasn't. Well, how do you explain his relationship with Putin? I, I, I can't, I, I don't, I, you know, I mean, I, there's the obvious he, he has admired strong men and there is the obvious he has been fascinated by Russia for 40 years. But beyond that, I can't begin to explain it. I just want to go back uh, to the question I just asked you about the election. Um, because I think it's a kind of a deeper psychological question than it might appear on the surface mm -hmm. that, okay, he, you know, he agreed that he lo lost immediately after the election, but never accepted it. Did he then internalize it? Like, um, do you think this is in some ways no longer fake on his part? Oh yeah, I don't know whether he actually believes this. I mean, I, I think it's very possible that he has convinced himself that he really did win. <laughs> Because he's he's very good at I mean, you know, he 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 has said to people a version of the same idea over many years, which goes to the repetition point, which is that if you say something often often enough, people believe it and it becomes true. That's true of himself too. That's, that's Joseph Goebbels. I know, I know, I know, I, I know the I know the heritage on yeah. it. Um, but uh, by the way, you mentioned the Mein Kampf that uh, yes. uh, Ivana Trump said that he had Mein Kampf and. Somebody else said he gave him a book of Hitler's. It was the speeches. Speeches. Yeah. Um, and his bedside table. What do you make of that? I don't think he read them, but I think that he, um, uh, but I think that he has had a fascination with, with Hitler um, for a while. And I don't, um, you know, Hitler is not somebody who, who, who most people in, in uh, mainstream America admire. So. Um, okay, this is uh, about you. Um, how many hours do you sleep a night? Not enough. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So uh, maybe this, tonight's the night. <laughs> this questioner wants to know if you have any time management tips. No, I am not who you come to for that. <laughs> no. Sounds like you do. Um, um, do you think Trump is evil? That's a really hard question to answer. Um, I think that he is he is comfortable enough with behavior that is evil, and I think that that's that's probably about as far as I can assess that. I'll answer it. Yes. <laughs> um, so you you kind of uh, address this, but let's go back at this um, uh, a little bit. Um, this is how scared he is right now about his legal troubles and the questioner makes a, a very interesting point that maybe his uh, malignant narcissism his you know his clear narcissistic personality disorder that says that he's a better president than anybody with the possible exception of abraham lincoln um but might that actually prevent him from feeling more vulnerable or does that not actually work that does the narcissism not help guard him against feeling he really understands vulnerable. legal problems i would just put them in a very different category than almost any other it is the thing that he has been most acutely attuned to all of his life and he has uh spent a very long time trying to cultivate prosecutors going back to you know, robert morgan Morgenthau. great figure of, of integrity i was disturbed to hear that he was as close to Trump as he, he was. And, and, and it is one of the reasons I think that Trump felt kind of comfortable that nothing bad was going to happen to Trump. Um, but he, uh, I, I just think that he experiences legal issues on a different level. So he, was he not that scared of uh, the New York uh, DA's investigation? Cy Vance was investigating when Alvin Bragg basically dropped it. I mean, he's not no, going he was, back to- He was very concerned about it. He was. And then he didn't get charged. And so, I, you know, it'll be very problematic for his company when this trial takes place because there are charges against his company. And, and Alan Weisselberg, the CFO, who pleaded guilty uh, a couple months ago, is going to testify. Um, but Trump himself wasn't criminally charged. And that really has become how he looks at all of these things. I mean, the, mm -hmm. as unhappy as he was with the, the Tish James civil suit, the New York attorney general, um, 
it's still a civil suit. Right. And that's the thing that they bear in mind. How about Fannie Willis in Georgia? Um, you know, that, that one makes them nervous. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, he, 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 he is facing a lot of legal problems. He is legal problems or threats. He is acutely aware of threats. And so that is why he gets that. So a lot of Democrats think, well, he'll always skate. He'll always uh, well, maybe he will figure out how to get away with it. Well, he was president. I mean, it was different when he was president. A sitting president wasn't going to get indicted, and you know, the the expectations around Mueller became a little too great. Um, not not by Mueller. I think Mueller was very, you know, sort of narrowly focused on his work. Um, but I think there were there were folks who had high hopes that that was going to end his presidency before its expiration date. And um, that was just not likely um, uh, at any point because of the Justice Department opinion on uh, indicting a sitting president. But now he is facing serious investigations. You know, it, somebody, he called, he called someone very close to him at the time, not anymore, um, two days after the Capitol riot and said, as he has wanted to do about everything, to poll test how everything is playing out. What do you think? And the person said, I think you've made a real mess. And I think this is the first time he is facing several simultaneous messes. But the, the, um, the people who talked to the January 6th committee, they really haven't been before the grand jury. I mean, we would know if they had, their lawyers would have which grand jury so, are you talking about? In the January 6th case. I'm not talking You're talking about, about the Justice Department, January yeah, 6th yeah, case. Yeah. Some of them have been. I mean, you know, we today, Mark Short, Pence's chief of staff, was back before the grand jury. So, I mean, some of them have been. But I don't, I mean, has Cassidy Hutchinson been in front of the grand jury? Uh, I believe she has been interviewed. I don't know if she's been before the grand jury. By investigators, I don't know if it's before the grand jury. So if you, again, I, I hate it when people ask us to get into the predictions business, but you have, but, <laughs> but you know more than everybody else. So you can make, without making a prediction, you can assess the odds more easily. So do you think on, he'll be indicted on the documents case? Or do you think he'll be indicted on the January 6th case? I don't know if he will be indicted on either, but I think that the documents case presents a, a clearer threat because it's just a, a, a clearer case. You know, even though he is, and for those of you who watched the January 6th hearing today, Benny Thompson, the chairman, uh, said this over and over again, that, you know, Trump was at the center of everything. And I think they've really tried showing that he's the one person who had visibility into all these different activities. Um, my understanding is that the Justice Department still doesn't feel like it has a clear sense of how to make that kind of case. Um, so uh, I know you're not a pollster and you're, you don't spend a huge amount of time talking to voters, but um, why do you think he's had such staying power and 70 million people voted for him the last time? Uh, so I think that, um, I don't really know how to answer that other than the fact that I think that he, um, he has been very successful at activating a lot of people who either haven't voted before or who have felt somehow left out of the process. And then I think there's a third issue, which is I think there's a really worthwhile study that wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do, but I think that the pollsters should do is of why so many people are open to, you know, a, a sort of a type of strongman leader in this country. And I would be curious to hear what comes back. Um, the subtitle of your book is The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. Um, how do you explain the latter part of it? What did he do to break this country? I think that he did not create, and you would know this far better than I do, but I think that he did not create the partisanship that has cleaved the country in two for a while, but he fueled it and he exacerbated it and he benefited from it. And he exported, and I write about this, that one of his guiding ethos is, you know, that he, he, he clearly expressed in the late 1980s in New York City during a, a terrible uh, case of violence in which teenagers of color were arrested and, and he took out an ad calling for the death penalty for them. Um, 
that he clearly saw hate as a civic good. And I think he exported that to Washington and I think he has exported it to his party. Uh, and I think that that has had a massive trickle down effect. I think that's a good, if depressing place to end. And that's all everybody, <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Jonathan. Not so